Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history living in your aquarium. Uh, today I've got some really awesome footage that I've been dying to show you guys. Uh, when I went down to Florida about a year ago now, this was some behind the scenes footage at the Florida State Aquaculture Lab and uh, their horticultural lab also. So this is the place where uh, Florida State University, University of Florida, and a bunch of different other uh, organizations, uh, institutes, and actually just little farms uh, all throughout the region. This is the area set up to study both uh, aquatic fish that will be in the trade of you know aquarium fish, so guppies, goldfish, Corys, plecos, whatever you you name it, but they also work on uh, what the farmers want to be selling and raising. Or you know, say Petco notices a trend that uh, PetSmart sells something and it's popular, or local breeders are doing rainbow fish. So you know, down there, uh, you know, they've worked with people like Rachel O'Leary or Gary Lang, and they've gotten samples of harder to find fish that maybe normally wouldn't be in the supply chain through seagrass farms or 5d or imperial like this county uh in florida is responsible for more of the aquatic trade in the united states of freshwater fish than all the other counties combined so it has over 50 it's like 57 percent of the aquatic fish farms and their wholesale trade go through this county uh, down outside of Tampa, Florida. This is on the uh, far east side of the bay uh, near, uh, I think it's called Ruskin, and uh, it's out near Seagrass Farms and their big wholesale plant that I've showed you guys some behind the scenes stuff of. However, on this trip, I wasn't able to show it to you guys right away because they were working on some species of fish that are getting released uh, to the hobby, to the farmers, and hopefully this season we may start seeing them in stores, like in mass, rather than just uh, here and there, or you know, small uh, local fish stores that have it from some collector. So, uh, amongst the fish they're working with are various plecos. Uh, they're working with uh, platinum fish, so like platinum gar. They're also working with some food fish. Um, they're working with jade perch. And then they're also working on some nano fish like the, um, the gulf uh, pygmy sunfish as well as the uh, Carolina pygmy sunfish and the Okeechobee or Okefenokee, Okeechobee I think it is, uh, pygmy sunfish. So they've got all three varieties there. I was able to see the setup for the gulf sunfish, these beautiful little blue fish, kind of like baddis, um, as well as what they're working on now is shiners. So they're working on shiners that can withstand warmer temperatures and be in a normal, you know, setup of your, your typical tropical fish. So uh, they've got these blue sailfin shiners, uh, they've got some silver shiners, rainbow shiners, uh, as well as uh, the other fish that they have there that they're checking out. And uh, elephant nose, uh, like knife fish, as well as uh, polypterus, or bichers, and uh, the big old alligator gars that they're raising in platinum versions. So this is a bit of a long one. It's a bit uncut. Sorry if the audio is a little uh, un. Di not dialed in there's a lot of machinery and stuff um i have a mic he has a mic but it it didn't really pick up very well at all so um yeah so prepare for that but this is stuff that i wasn't allowed to show you guys until they made an announcement to the farmers and to the agricultural board i've been told that that's happened and so this is a real behind the scenes thing and i really want to thank them for trusting me in filming this especially the firefish uh, saltwater that he mentions that they have figured out how to breed in captivity as well as several puffer species uh, that are often found in conflict zones they're figuring out how to breed those as well with hormones and things. So uh, in this, you'll see some science. You'll see a little bit of like how they breed fish. They try different mediums. They try different diets, water, 
for the fry, you know, different hardness, different, um, all sorts of different parameters. And then they pass that on to the farmers and then they grow the fish with whatever worked best at this research institute. So uh, beyond that, sorry if I'm not focusing on his head, I have a secondary camera at the scene and someday I'll cut that all together when I'm allowed to finally show everything. Um, and hopefully I can show the firefish footage soon too because that was really cool to see the baby firefish uh, in this lab. But other than that, I hope you enjoy it. I'm sorry I talk over him a little bit. I was really excited. We've been there, you know, hours, and we were kind of just jiving and bouncing back and forth. And uh, I got a little ahead of myself. Sorry, buddy. But uh, if you guys enjoy this, please hit like, subscribe, and you can support the channel and more trips like this to really cool places, universities, and labs all around uh, the U.S. I'd love to travel all around the world, too. Um, by uh, checking out Patreon, Super Chat during uh, live chats, and then uh, also just clicking like and subscribe and sharing it if you think it deserves it. So here we go. Here's the stuff that nobody has footage of but, but me, and you're going to see it first here. So check it out and get ready for uh, all these shiners and pygmy sunfish that they're going to release into the market for hobbyists in America and the world soon. All right, here we go. Take care, guys. Yeah. Feels cooler as we move back in here. Is there any intention to that? No, I think it's just kind of the way just that life. it worked out. Yeah. Um, we had alligator at our spawn, so I want to show you guys. Cool, that. yeah. I'll, I'll explain that as well. Um, anyway, so these are some of the native species that I was talking about. That's not, but um, <laughs> that's angelfish. Yeah. Um, Here's, here's the Gulf Coast Pygmy Sunfish that I was talking about. These are great fish. There's some on the bottom there. They're really cool. The, the male will color up, guys, and uh, the male will color up this dark blue to black color, and then all the other males will either submit to that one male usually, or <laughs> the females will kind of fall in line. But, oh, I see one other one down there. They're probably all hiding in the back. Oh, there's yeah. one up there, too. Oh yeah, very cool. And then, so these, so we're working on these, like Matt said, and then we have the sail fin shiners over here. Those are beautiful. Well, yeah, they're very beautiful. And if you look at the different substrates that we're trying to see which one they're going to prefer to spawn on. So we have over here, we have some. some is that rock. what that is? Yeah, you know, sort of to mimic, the, you know, the the pebble bottom, the, the the dead branches, the plants coming off the bottom, and then the plants coming off the top. Is this really? That's that rough enough. And no, it's, no, it's no. a pom pom. From like, yeah. <laughs> it's a cri like acrylic essentially or <laughs> something. Like Polyvinyl. Yeah, really, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah. So, I see snails in this tank. Is that intentional or? No, I think they just get in there. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. And so you're testing out. That's like a a toilet scrubber or something, yeah, it's right? It's a bottle brush. Right? Bottle so brush. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then it sort of that mimics that or a hard branch. Yeah. Bottom. Yeah. Have. Really, we just want to see what they're going to prefer to spawn on. And you'll see when we go out and see the alligator dar, so there's a ton of these sort of pom poms that they've spawned onto. And really, it's a way for us, and we want them to be sterile. It's a way for us to take that out yeah. and put that somewhere else so that they can hatch off of that. We don't really want any real plants or real branches. Is, okay. is, um, is, is there. This is another form of organics in the water. Do you, no. have, do you ever try the thread? Like the wool, acrylic wool, uh, or you know, mimic of wool, like yarn. No, nah. uh, well, we've tried yarn, but it's mostly this kind of cloth yarn. Okay. Um, uh, no. Just because. Sure, they've tried a bunch of stuff. Because that's just what hobbyists tend to use, and oh, yeah. so if there's something that works better, you know, yeah, it's yeah. good to I, let people know. Yeah, I think uh, you know, it's just really throwing stuff at them, especially when you're dealing with a new species and you don't really know much about them. Yeah. Um, doing doing some research. Uh, through, through the journal articles, looking at some forums, looking at that anecdotal information as well, and then really just throwing everything at them and see what happens. You know, the information that you're gathering, like when you learn this, are you guys um, have series of papers that you're writing, or do you put it into a journal, or do you, so, I mean, like, is all there a goal that's going on? Yeah, here? I mean, it's really all of it. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll have, when we find something out that, the, that, that we want the Florida farmers to know, it's usually it happens in a workshop, and that's kind of my job too, so, I, so I'll go and like, I'll see it firsthand, and when I'm out visiting people, I'll tell them this is what I saw, and this is what. Do you have a Twitter account? 
I do. Actually, do. So okay, I, just, I have. I run cool. a Twitter account. I'm the only goofball here that, that runs a Twitter account. <laughs> um, but Amy, who just walked in here, uh, runs our Facebook account. I also run our YouTube. But that's a lot of the YouTube is for schools. So we do. Sure. High schools and middle schools. A lot of that's for them. Um, and Twitter's for schools too. Most of the farmers don't really yeah. utilize social media all that much. I just so figured we want to get found into something. So we'll have a workshop like at the lab too, where we'll, we'll say, all right. So Matt's had one on our team here replacement, where we had the farmers come here and talk about some of that our team replacement information, so that they can get it firsthand. Yeah. And we also write um, what we call Edis publications, which are more technical papers. Okay. And then we also write journal articles, which are uber scientific and are embedded. It takes years for the journal articles to come out. So they'll do a study on science self 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 in shiners and get replicated data, that'll be vetted. It takes years to actually sure. come out as a journal article. It's usually after the fact, right? Um, those EDIS publications, those take a little bit longer, about a year, but the workshops are instantaneous and that face to face interaction is pretty instantaneous. And so we try to get that to our Florida farmers as soon as possible. And and so so basically, I mean, I read those journal articles, yeah. and then we, you know, as, as hobbyists, we read the journal articles, and then we try to replicate things we learn from there, but... It's hard. So that's interesting to learn, though, that that's so out of date compared to probably what's going on down so here at that like by Cape, that point. Cape Pacific Blue Tangs, like when we did Yeah, Pacific yeah. Blue Tangs, that was a big accomplishment. That, was, that probably came out two or three years yeah. after we had actually spawned it. Yeah, and that's, that's a huge... I mean that's a huge accomplishment for, for what it does to the environment in Hawaii or wherever, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know, we always battle with how to get that information out um, in, in a timely manner. And is there? And, and sometimes, honestly, social media is really sometimes not the best form. Yeah. To do it so I was curious. Sometimes the best form is just like we're doing right now. Yeah. Just talking face to face, talking. Yeah. Oh, word will spread if something works or something doesn't. You know. These People are all Gulf, uh, Gulf Coast pygmy sunfish. So oh wow! We're all here. So and this is like if they have Artemia feeding or not, or I don't know what the, the study is, but it looks like they're doing Artemia, Moena, and Golden Pearls. Okay, so GP stands for Golden Pearls. I believe, I believe that so. makes sense. I don't know if that's true. I do see some stuff on the bottom. It like so it looks like here we've got one alpha male. That's kind of cool. Is there is there the same number of fish at the start of the experiment in each tank usually? Or? I don't know how this experiment's been set up, but it, they're definitely whatever they're looking at, which it looks like they're looking at. Um, I don't know. I'm see three in. So maybe they're doing groups versus pairs. I'm not. I'm really not yeah. sure what, what, what the purpose of the experiment is. Looks like they're all doing the These same. Jay Perch. One of our farmers is looking at them for food fish. Can you get your camera that you catch how many that are in there? Oh, there's, yeah, it's there's like tons a, of It's like a fog. Oh, the <laughs> perch in here? Yeah, yeah, the jade perch, the Australian jade perch. I don't know anything about jade perch, so Over that's... Here, it's food fish. Food fish, so... We really don't do much food fish uh, research. Oh, wow. The farmer is, is interested in... This was just kind of a one-off. That's 15. not something that we typically do. It's interesting, though. Like, I mean... Yeah, it's all interesting. Someone had asked us to see if we can spawn them, and we were able to successfully. Nice. Now, what do you know what's going on in here? I see some quarries and some... This is sort of just a, a hodgepodge of stuff. Okay. Um, here's the metallic shiner. Uh, oh, nice. The microworms and artemia. As you can see, I'm guessing they're a couple of weeks old. Yeah. Some definitely grow so much faster than others, and I always wonder, yeah, you know, if if that's just nature's way of spreading out who lives and who goes out into the big water first, kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of it could be environment too. You mm. know, the more advantageous environment. Yeah. Um, that's temperature has a lot to do with it. And then so. There's a lot of perch in here. Really. Yeah, I know that is crazy. You guys succeeded beyond. Actually, this isn't all of them either. But. Yeah, th th this is cool. So. Are all of these on a, uh, a shared air? and this is all research. So okay. Some sure some down here? Sump, it's just, it's like, it should be a UV. I don't see others. There's UV. Okay. Into a sump and, uh, and then the header sump is, is feeding the fish tanks. Great. Okay. Cool. Simple, simple research system. Yeah. And we're able to also flow through, too. So we have well water. We have treated well water. We have RO. And then we have research. So we're able, if there was a water quality problem, we were able to... Uh, be able to solve that with water exchange. That's cool. So is the water coming coming out of this region? Is it 
hard pH? I mean, with the limestone so, bedrock and all that? Uh, it can be. Uh, we can get hardness up into the 400 uh, milligrams per liter. It's okay. Hard water. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ours is 25 really, in Seattle. Yeah, so. it really <laughs> ranges. It, well, that's really solid. Too. Yeah, it um, is. Uh, but uh, it really ranges quite a bit. Um, typically, it's around 250. Okay. Which is what the alkalinity is around, too. So we really have that calcium carbon, that limestone water. Yeah. It's uh, very buffered with that alkalinity. And our pH can range, but typically it's sort of seven, give or, give or take a point here and there. Okay. Um, that's actually like, I mean, that surprises really, me that it's, it's yeah, that's it's awesome. actually really good for raising yeah. fish. Is that because of the, probably the rain, too? Yeah, and access to the aquifer. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. That makes sense. Speaking of which, there's our well over there. Okay. Um, right beside where there. And then, of course, we have to treat our well water so it has to be degassed, which is what those three columns are doing there. Sure. Which is degassing hydrogen sulfide, CO2. I was wondering why I could smell the sulfur. I was yeah. like, what? what is that? I'm Mostly just curious. Mostly, in this, in this Ruskin Waimama region, we have a lot of uh, hydrogen sulfide in the water. Okay. Out in Lakeland, you have a lot of CO2 in the water. Interesting. So, really... Uh, I would rather have hydrogen sulfide. It's easier, yeah. it's easier to off gas. Yeah. And uh, it's not, I mean, it is extremely toxic, it's but it's easier. Younger off-gas. water, too. I mean, and the CO2 tends to be a little bit more difficult to off gas. Yeah. It's is pretty toxic to the fish. So. Yeah. I mean, we get some of them. Good for plants, though, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have to treat our water, and then we hold it, and then it pumps uh, through the rest of the facility. So the five greenhouses and the building itself are getting the treated well water. And the ponds are just getting directly uh, pumped from the well. So. And so these ponds out here, these are all test pond kind of things, yeah, basically? Yeah, so when we bought our facility, at least the office that you guys first walked into, okay. the weather station, you saw the radar when you walked into. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. and the, weather, the blue roof over there is their new building. So that's their new offices, and the old offices is where we are. Okay. That's our, our offices. Yeah. And there was a fish farm right beside us. So it's not a coincidence that we chose this spot. Again, we're in Hillsborough County. Uh, Hillsborough County, Polk County, that's where the highest concentration of ornamental fish farms are. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, uh, we wanted to have this, this a, a, a really a, a small-scale fish farm so that we could do replicated studies, and we could go to the industry and say, hey, this is going to work in a pond, not right. just a, a fish tank. That's our illustrious director, Mr. Craig Watson. Hello. And Chris. And Chris. Director and illustrious director and Chris yeah the beard says so right yeah well thanks for letting us come look around I see you have no shortage of tanks stacked over there <laughs> we're gonna come back yeah to greenhouse one okay because uh, we do most of the industry is freshwater fish yeah yeah so there, like I said there's 100 125 farmers because of he ask uh, maybe even more um, most of that is freshwater. Yeah. But we do some marine research, and it technically kind of starts in Greenhouse 5, which is where the marine stock are. And the marine law of rearing is in 1, so it's kind of backwards to, to show you that. Way. So yeah. We'll, we'll start in Greenhouse 2. Uh, we do have some firefish, uh, which are at 20 days. Uh, wow. So those are pretty cool. So you'll That's see cool, yeah. Off. It's always such a bummer when you get fish to a point of, you know, like fry size and then they don't make it. You're oh, like, what is going on? So this is greenhouse two. Um, not a ton going on in here, except for this may be where they grow up the gar. Kate, so crayfish, crayfish. Yeah. So I mean, shrimp are a huge part of the market now. The, hey, Micah, are these the gar? Yeah. Wow, these are beautiful. What are these? So. Bowfin? Bowfin? No, can't be What? They're beautiful. I've never seen these. Yeah, they're yeah. bowfin. So those are native to here, right? That's cool. Wow. So anyway, so, you, so yeah, that's bowfin. That's, that's a bowfin. I just saw those uh, up at um, Silver Springs. Oh, that's cool. It's like big, almost yeah, two feet long. Collecting. Cool. Uh, but you see the pom pom, those are the alligator arm eggs. So we were just spawning Oh, them. wow out on the edge of Greenhouse 5 and we got all these pom-poms with alligator gar eggs on them. 
So the you you immediately separate them from their parents sure, within a few absolutely. days. Yeah. We'll probably put the parents back in the ponds. I'd be surprised if they're in there. Now, when breeders self in China. Okay. And those are the pom poms here for spawning substrate, but those are alligator RX eggs, and there may be more straight throughout. These, These are the eggs. The yeah. So what we Those are big eggs. When LSU spawned them a while, a couple years ago, it's been about five years ago. Um, white gar. Okay. White so, oh wow, platinum. So that's not, yeah, it's platinum. Absolutely. So it's not albino. Like it is white. Uh, we call it leucistic. Wow. So that strain is. We have the brothers and sisters of that strain, and when we spawn them, occasionally we get some white ones. Wow. Do you know what the uh, rate of that is at all? I mean, just no. roughly? So we get, like, like, per spawn, and I don't know how many eggs are in the, are in the alligator of our spawn. I'm guessing thousands. Yeah. 20,000 or so? I don't even know. Um, we'll get, like, four four white ones. And do you, you call those melanistic, or, like, what's... Leucistic. Leucistic. Okay. All right. And so, so they have, these are the only two we have right now. And so they have the normal eye color, no red eyes or anything like right. that. And no, you guys should see the tail where the black spots are. Oh wow, that's great. So they do have some coloration to them. And so that's really cool in that a lot of times organisms have internal albinism and that causes a lot of health problems. Right. And this is a, a sustainable fish when you get a platinum This is actually white, yeah. Species. Actually, or yeah, platinum. They do call it platinum in the trade. In, yeah, in the hobby, I right. mean. Yeah. So that's why some of the terms I know are interchangeable. So are we, is this a male and a female trying to spawn? No. Oh, okay. These are just progeny, the only two that we have left right now. Okay. And we're hoping from this recent spawn, because we now the yeah. natural coloration of the dark. I think they're probably still in the pool, maybe not. Yeah. Um, so we're hoping to get some more white offspring yeah. once these hatch. And these are, are originally spotted gar or Florida gar alligator. or alligator gar. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's going to look crazy when they're big. Yeah, exactly. So there is one that can't, that's at Florida Aquarium that came from this lineage. Uh huh. LSU. They didn't come from us, they came from LSU. And he's got to be. Three or four feet by now. Wow. I haven't seen them in a while. So, do you do you know when you get this this uh, white trait? Is is this something that you find in all species, pretty much? Do you know? I mean, no. Um, I know that you see it um, with gambusia. You'll see a melanistic gambusia or a leucistic gambusia. To me, that seems like something that in Seattle we'd buy. You know what I mean? Like we'd be yeah. interested because we buy guppies. We buy. Uh, Sail fins and mollies and you know all sorts of live bears up there. Anyways, I've not heard it in every species, but those are the two I've definitely heard it in. There's sure. Probably more examples of that. Is it okay if I step out and make a phone call? Please, Please do. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Cool. yeah, that's awesome. So, are you feeding them shellfish of some we sort? Feed too? Them, we crayfish. Feed them, uh, pellets, but we also feed them some crayfish. Yeah. As well. Great. So we have some polypterus here, and those are. Oh yeah. Polyp okay, so these so are albino. The natural coloration, but then you also see albino polypterus. That's a pretty high rate there, in, or were these selected? They were selected. Okay, all right. And do we know if the albinism is a like a trait that is dominant or recessive or co-dominant? I don't, I don't know, but sure. I would say it's probably recessive. I would say. It's surprising to me sometimes when it's not, and I'm like, what? Like all my, uh, I have a green. Uh, so green dragon plecos are actually an al an original albino morph that was then bred back into the line, uh -huh. and part of the gene still expresses itself. There's a three part gene, wow. but it I just always is weird to me how that works different in different species. Um, puffers? puffers? Oh wow! Green so spotted puffers. They have the, the, the shortest. Uh, vertebrate genome. So yeah, there's some genetic research on them as well. That's very so they have the shortest. Will you say that one more time? Just shortest vertebrate genome. Wow. So they do genetics work with them. So Pretty is interesting though. Any uh, idea why that is? I do not know. Wow. Um, they're very cool looking. They are cool. And uh, they're actually, <laughs> they make pretty cool pets, but you can't keep anything else with them. Right. They're, they're pretty nasty. Like most so puffers. Fish, right? we, we've got some puffers at my house that basically don't get along with anything but puffers. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's cool. And are these full grown, do you know? Or do these get bigger? I don't think they get much bigger. Okay. They're, they're definitely pretty close if they're not there. Yeah. 
So they're kind of like Shodentai or Amazonian helper size. Right, exactly. Okay. Cool. It's pretty interesting. We are able to hormone induce spawn them. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you know much about hormone induction, but a lot of the industry is. Um, it's a way to control the spawning process. Sure, you don't want it just in the winter once a year or whatever. Right, exactly. Yep. So we're able to uh, uh, use overprim because these are not for food fish, but there's other, you know, you can use HCG. There's other hormones that you can inject into the fish to get the female. Mostly it's the female, but there's the, the male will let down too as well. But get to the fish to release her eggs and, her, and him to release his milk. You can strip spawn them. You can, yeah. they can spawn within a tank as well. Okay. Um, but a lot of the freshwater in industry is simply to control when those uh, fish are going to be in ponds or when they're going to be harvested. A lot of that is done through hormone induction. So have you gotten, you know, Mubu puffers and some of the harder puffers to spawn? Have, has that all uh, been? Actually, these guys were very difficult. We were not able to use a needle. We had to actually flush the ovary with the, um, the hormone. Uh-huh. And that, was, that is what forced her to release her eggs. So you actually have to... an ovarian lavage, but... It, it was flushing over ovaries with, with that hormone. Wow. Yeah, it's a little bit different. So yeah. It's not exactly... Not something every breeder would be doing at home either. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, so the price will stay high. high. Sometimes it can be difficult. Sometimes it's not. You know? it, just, it just makes me think that the price will stay high on these fish for a while. Well, it, like and I like on my channel to talk about conflict zones and uh, native indigenous people who harvest the fish. Uh, and Congo right now, as people on my channel know is having a very hard time, we're having a hard time getting puffers out of the okay. wild because there has been an ongoing war there for 20 years. Sure. Um, so that's why I'm very interested if, if you guys can get some of these, you know, uh, Congolese or hard to breed African. So we always take our cues from the mark, the industry. Okay. The so in if a farmer comes to us or farmers as a group come to us and say, hey, we want you to do research on this species, then that's what we'll do. Okay. Um, so that's really who we take a lot of our cues from. Could, is it okay if I film these vats real quick? Please. Go ahead. So we got. I actually want to walk through and see how many gar yeah. eggs. We so we've got the polypterus uh, and the rosy. It says rosy barb too. I don't see yeah. rosy barb in there. Oh, wait, there. I do see some. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, so there are a few rosy barbs in here. Most of the labeling is up to date, but I know that we have to move it for stuff. Sure. Like so they've got little styrofoam blocks, guys, uh, for spawning. Uh, holding up and then they've got buckets here, which is really interesting. It's a shaded way and the elephant knows that's what's in here And this is gonna be real hard to see these guys are really fun fish these elephant nose fish and you can see their elephant nose they've got a long elephant nose and uh, Those are a fun fish and they're just getting blood worms twice a day uh, Which could easily be done at home. Uh, I don't know if these were hormone induced spawns but, and then more albino polypterus with some giant plecos. These are just normal, uh, these are the plecos that have escaped into the wild here. Uh, but the polypterus, that's really cool. That is really cool. Uh, yeah.